Hello everyone and welcome to today's ER Durana Welfare webinar and thank you very much to you all for joining us. May I introduce myself, my name is Sally Binding and I'm the IASA Animal Welfare Coordinator and I have alongside me Sandrine Kamru who is the IASA Communications Officer and Sandrine will be um, looking after all the technical issues um, so please contact her in the chat should you have any problems. And before I introduce our speaker, could I please ask yourself to remain on mute throughout the webinar. Um, however, do enable your chat function and ask any questions that you might have to Heather in there. And I'll try to give as many people the opportunity to ask their question directly to Heather during the Q&A session. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Heather Bacon. Heather is the Veterinary Welfare Education and Outreach Manager at the Edinburgh University's Xi'an Marshig Centre, International Centre from Animal Welfare Education. She lectures internationally on animal welfare and teaches a postgraduate MSc at the University of Edinburgh. She's worked extensively on both companion and exotic animal welfare and delivering lectures and practical workshops the world over and with an especially focusing on veterinary welfare knowledge and skills throughout Asia. She was previously the director of Animals Asia's China Bear Rescue Center, where I had the great pleasure of working alongside her. And therefore she has extensive world renowned knowledge on bear veterinary medicine. She's also a contributing author to the EU Zoos Directive Good Practices document. She has a BSc in conservation medicine, a degree in veterinary medicine and surgery, a postgraduate certificate in zoological medicine, and she's currently doing her PhD in animal welfare education. So it's my great pleasure and honour and thanks for you to join us today, Heather, and I hand over to you. If you could please share your video. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, so we will get started. So uh, this animal welfare webinar um, is on behalf of EASA, the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria, and um, the University of Edinburgh. And I'd just like to um, express my gratitude and thanks to EASA for arranging this series of webinars uh, and for inviting me to participate. It's really nice to connect with you all. So we're going to be talking today about quality of life assessments. So we'll crack on with that and get started. Okay. okay, so in this presentation, we're going to first of all briefly define some of the terms that we'll be using, uh, specifically animal welfare, quality of life and ethics and how those three things interact when we're making decisions around animal welfare assessment. Um, we'll be looking at the different factors that might influence our ethical decision making around animal welfare assessment and outlining some of the common welfare challenges that we might see and discussing some strategies for decision making in animal welfare assessments. Just to highlight um, a few useful resources as we um, go through, um, these are resources that you might want to have a look at in your own time which hopefully will support some of the material that we talk about today. So obviously the EASA Animal Welfare webpage. Um, if you're a member of the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria, then the Animal Welfare Toolkit, which can be found in the Animal Husbandry resources, is very useful. And of course, the open access resource, the WASA Welfare Strategy Caring for Wildlife, which you can find on the WASA website. So first of all, why are we starting off with definitions? They're a little bit dull. Um, it's, definitions are actually really important and especially when we're working in a, a diverse international community such as the zoo community because we obviously all speak different languages, there are slightly different interpretations of terminology, we all have different cultures and different perspectives and it's really easy for us to be speaking at cross purposes. And particularly when we are talking about animal welfare, which is a subject which often has an emotional component, then it can be really easy for us to perhaps misunderstand what other people are saying. And so good definitions are really important because they advance communication and understanding of the topic of which we're discussing. So the way in which we define a term ultimately affects the way in which it can be applied or the, how it might be measured. And so it's really important that we have a common understanding of the terms that we're using. So 
the one of the interesting things about animal welfare is that there is no universal definition of animal welfare and many uh, very clever people have put forward many different definitions of animal welfare and quite often different organizations will develop their own definition of welfare that is meaningful and relevant to them but there are often common themes within all of those different different definitions of animal welfare Usually those definitions include something about um, animal welfare being a quality of an animal or how an animal is coping or something about that animal's life that is measurable. And uh, we're often quite clear that when we're measuring that animal's welfare, it is giving us an instantaneous assessment of the animal's welfare at that particular time. It's not really giving us that overall lifelong assessment. So it's how an animal might be coping, it's a measurable um, thing and it's uh, within a, a particular time frame and it usually comprises physical or physiological, behavioural and psychological or mental characteristics. These are all of the things that we need to consider when we're measuring animal welfare. If we move on to quality of life, this is a bit trickier. So quality of life is something that originated in um, human medicine. And the sort of primary definition within in the human sphere is that from the World Health Organization, which defines quality of life as an individual's perception of their position in life in the context of the culture and value systems in which they live, and in relation to their goals, expectations, standards and concerns. So quality of life is really something that uh, is context specific and um, that is relative to other people around us. So your quality of life in one country might be quite different to your expected quality of life in a different country depending on the culture and value and the, the legal standards, the, the human rights legislation, the socio-economic status, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's something which fluctuates and varies and it depends upon how it relates to our expectations. So it's a comparative rather than an objective assessment. And because of this, it's pretty difficult to apply this definition to animals, because as far as we're aware, animals don't necessarily have the same sort of socioeconomic standards or culture and value systems that we might have. So it's a pretty tricky concept to apply in the same way to animals as we might apply it to humans. However, we do use this Hello. term. Yep. I apologies to interrupt. Could we just no ask to slide your cursor down from the top of the screen? Thank sure. you. It's just creating a black bar across the top. Okay, Thanks. no worries. Thanks, Sally. Thank you very much. So we do use the term quality of life um, in relation to animals. And when we use it, we tend to use it in two different ways. So again, this can create confusion because um, we don't use it in the same way as we use it when we are talking about human quality of life. And we don't um, have as clear a, a definition of what quality of life comprises in animals as we do um, in terms of things like defining animal welfare. So the two ways in which we use the term quality of life um, might be to evaluate the quality of an animal's overall life within the life worth living concept. So does this animal have overall a good life from birth through to death um, through its whole life experience? And we might do that through regular welfare assessments throughout the animal's life to repeatedly measure its welfare and then get a composite assessment of its whole life throughout its lifespan. Or in some cases we can use retrospective post-mortem measures. So after an animal has died there are specific things that we might be able to look at which give us an idea of its overall quality of life. So we might look at different measures of clinical pathology, health and behaviour by reviewing its medical records over its whole life for example. Or we can look at um, parts of the brain such as the hippocampus which uh, reduces in size and and uh, there are various neurological changes in response to circulating stress hormones. And that's been used uh, as a measure 
in some of our domestic farm species such as poultry to give us a, an idea of how their quality of life or their stress uh, response has has been over their whole life experience it's not really something we use so much in the zoo world so in zoo species evaluating overall quality of life can be really challenging and that because animals move around, they experience different stresses in different collections, they experience different uh, sort of husbandry provisions and different human animal interactions in different um, situations. And so really welfare assessment is probably a more accurate term for what we're doing because most of the time when we're doing this in zoo animals we are looking within a specific time frame to see what that animal's welfare currently is rather than looking across its whole life. The other way in which we use the term quality of life is to make a clinical assessment um, to aid end of life decision making. And we'll talk a bit more about this because this is probably the arena where we tend to use the sort of quality of life terminology uh, a bit more. Because it's associated with making decisions about end of life uh, in our animals, it can be associated with moral stress. Um, so it can make us feel really quite uncomfortable. It can be psychologically difficult to make those decisions. And we'll talk a bit more about that. But overall, the lack of clear definitions around quality of life and the lack of consistent application can mean that we often end up talking at cross purposes when we're talking about quality of life. So if you're using that that term I think it's really important um, that you are clear on what you mean by it and that the people you are talking to also understand what you mean by it um, and in this presentation we'll be looking at, at both of, of these situations where we might use that terminology and how we might make decisions so first of all let's look at overall quality of life that sort of uh, life worth living concept I think firstly we have to recognise that we aren't that good at making decisions to safeguard animal welfare even in our domestic species. So this is just a study that I was involved in in the UK last year or moving into this year um, looking at a number of different domestic species and identifying common welfare priorities across all of those species that are managed under human care in the UK and you can see the list of, of prioritised welfare issues that we came up with and certainly in my experience I see some of these issues also occurring within the zoo community and I'm sure that some of those issues will be familiar um, to you guys as well. So I don't think that that's necessarily a reflection on um, on you know zoos as an institution or, or, or on um, farms as an institution or on pet owners as an institution. I think it's just that as humans we do struggle to make objective decisions unless we have an objective welfare assessment measure and that's why assessing animal welfare is really important. If we can measure something, we can identify problems and we can manage those problems. And similarly, we can identify things that we are doing really well and we can enhance animal welfare. So often we consider animal welfare assessment as being something that, that minimises negative experiences for animals. And it does, and it is important for that, but it's also a really useful tool for promoting positive experiences for animals by identifying things that they really enjoy and maximising opportunities for them to engage with those things. And there are now a number of different welfare assessment tools that have been published within the zoo community and across a wide range of species. Um, just highlighting this one because it's a, a recent one um, by Paul Rose and Michelle O'Brien. And it's also really nice to see it in a non-mammalian taxa because quite often a lot of our welfare assessments are still very much focused on, on mammal species. But generally our welfare assessments will follow this sort of cyclical pattern of observation, performing a, a welfare assessment or audit, reviewing the results and engaging with, with stakeholders, implementing changes, then more, more observations to assess how those changes may have affected the animals, repeating that welfare assessment to objectively evaluate the impact of those husbandry changes, and again reviewing the results with stakeholders. So it should be that cyclical process of uh, making changes and assessing the, the impact of those changes um, so that we know that we're doing a good job and we can objectively demonstrate that. 
There are lots of different types of welfare assessment tools out there and you can find uh, a number of different ones on the ERs website as open access um, tools that have been made available. Broadly, um, a lot of them will cover similar aspects of the animal's experience. So we'll consider the animal's nutritional experience as a, a minimum. Obviously, we have uh, life support that we would, we would be providing. But really, as much as possible, we want to be considering providing that good quality of life, that enhanced life in terms of um, how we might present food, the frequency of food, quality, the nutritional balance. Similarly with environmental resources, we want uh, those to be uh, positive um, environment focused opportunities that meet the species specific needs and provide positive social, cognitive and sensory interactions. We want our animals to be healthy, strong and active and to uh, minimise any experiences of sickness, weakness, pain or injury. And we want to provide our animals with positive behavioural experiences such as exploration, foraging and interaction with their environments and their social conspecifics and minimizing any negative uh, behavioral experiences, um, any behavioral frustration, um, any abnormal repetitive or injurious behaviors or any excessive behaviors. So things like excessive resting behaviors, excessive inactivity or apathy behaviors. Um, and the reason that we tend to use these categories uh, of, of different um, elements of welfare assessment is because these give us a reasonably good uh, insight into the animal's psychological or mental state, which is something that we can't directly measure. So in humans, obviously, we can ask people how they're feeling and they can report their feelings to us. Animals cannot do that. And so we have to use these proxy measures of emotional state um, by looking at their behavior, their physical health, their resources and their nutrition in order to try and make um, a determination as to how they might be feeling in that situation. And really animal welfare is all about how the animal feels. Um, it's well recognized within the scientific literature that animals are capable of a range of different emotional states and that suffering can occur when negative feelings are prolonged. So it's important to promote those positive emotional states in our animals. And we have to, as we've already said, infer those from a variety of different measures because we can't ask our animals how they feel. And that's where our welfare assessment tools are really important because they allow us to do that in an objective and um, comprehensive manner. So repeated welfare assessments over time can help us to build a picture of the animal's quality of its life over its whole life, from when it's very young through to when it's much older. I think it's really important that we avoid welfare assessments being a quality of life assessment tool that leads only to euthanasia that we only use in our older animals um, as a way of um, making decisions about euthanasia because actually we need that baseline data we need to be able to track changes and progress over time and also if we only use welfare assessments when we're worried about making a euthanasia decision then that generates stigma around welfare assessments people start to be worried about engaging with them because they're worried that this is only a euthanasia decision making tool and it really shouldn't be we should be starting welfare assessments with younger healthy animals across all of the different species so that we can identify what they need and ensure that we're providing for it and also so we can monitor their behavior and, and their emotional states by proxy Animal welfare assessments can also be a useful tool when we are thinking about collection planning. They can help us to identify which animals may need more resources allocated to them and which animals are doing really well in a collection. If you're a collection that is, is managing a species and perhaps wanting to move on to a related species that is of higher conservation value, by demonstrating that you can provide good welfare for the more common species, you can build a case with the EEP that you would be able to provide good welfare for um, the species of, of greater conservation value. 
So they can be of real practical use as well as being helpful for the actual animal and for improving animal welfare. There's a lot of logistical value to welfare assessments in terms of ensuring that we are spending our limited budgets in the most appropriate manner, that we are delivering resources to the animals that need those resources the most, and that we're not accidentally overlooking animals that perhaps are less charismatic or that we are less engaged with. So they should be a normal and objective part of um, routine record keeping across as many species as possible within the collection. They are, however, having said that, also useful when we are making decisions about end of life management. And that is the second sort of area in which we tend to use um, animal welfare assessments. And that's often when we use the quality of life terminology. Um, if we're making end of life decisions, that's often much easier when there's a very rapid decline, if there's a very obvious change in an animal's welfare state. If it suddenly becomes very sick, for example. But if we don't observe that rapid decline, then animal repeated animal welfare assessments can be useful in terms of monitoring a, a slower and more gradual decline and helping us to put um, in place um, specific points which we think uh, specific thresholds which are not acceptable for animal welfare and that can aid with making decisions around end of life so otherwise those gradual degenerative changes can just happen slowly they can creep in and sometimes they're not observed um, or not um, noted as clearly as they should be if we're proactively assessing the welfare of our animals it also means that we can identify problems early and potentially treat them better. So they're not always um, about making end of life decisions. Sometimes they're about delivering better quality veterinary care or more resources that are more appropriate for that animal stage of life as well. So they work both ways. Um, they're not always uh, necessarily a tool that always leads to euthanasia. And I, I do think it's really important to consider that. So just some of the, the challenges that we do need to think about when we are thinking about end of life um, care and the problems that our, our zoo populations do face. It's been recognised for a number of years um, that um, zoo animals live uh, generally much longer than their natural lifespan in the wild and that this confers uh, potential welfare problems or welfare challenges in terms of how we might manage them within the zoo environment. So this is uh, an old paper from 2002 by Andrew Kitchener and Alistair MacDonald um, and they presented what they call the longevity legacy of old animals in zoos and this was looking primarily at large charismatic taxa um, and examining them for skeletal and dental pathologies here in the National Museums of Scotland uh, and then looking at the numbers of animals that had significant pathology. So this is a little bit like what I mentioned at the beginning, um, that sort of retrospective analysis of an animal's health and medical records, looking at its skeletal and dental pathologies post-mortem to be able to evaluate what its quality of life might have been like when it was alive. And studies like this are useful, but they do tend to show that quite often a lot of the species that we manage in zoos are suffering from significant pathology and physical degeneration before they die and that is likely to lead to considerable welfare problems. So this is a particular issue in larger species but it can affect um, all species and any animal that is living you know to an extended lifespan in the zoo environment is likely to develop some kind of pathology. Um, we see uh, you know, changes across all species such as increased fat stores and reduced lean muscle, the development of painful conditions such as osteoarthritis and dental disease. So these kinds of things are, are fairly universal. And um, more recent studies have shown, um, so this is a, a 2007 study that did a similar thing, look at, looking at physical condition and quality of life in geriatric zoo animals. And this one uh, develops an objective, more objective scoring system um, but again, looking at health and medical and post-mortem records um, and the actual skeletons of the animals after they died demonstrated that there were significant pathological changes um, and the hypothesis was pro proposed that euthanasia is often delayed to the detriment of the animal's welfare. So this supports what we've seen in other um, animal 
care industries where often as humans we do struggle with making that euthanasia decision and there are a number of reasons for that but it can be uh, a real animal welfare problem. So senescence or aging is a normal physiological process that occurs in all of us um, and it results in reduced function of all body systems and eventual death. So old age in and of itself is not a disease, but of course, as age increases, we are predisposed to a greater variety of different pathological conditions, which can negatively impact upon animal welfare. And these are often painful conditions, it might be reduced physical strength, reduced cognitive function, um, etc. And there are a variety of different veterinary and non-veterinary techniques that we can apply to help to improve animal welfare. I'm just going to touch on a couple of um, free common uh, things that perhaps we, we don't pay quite as much attention to or are more challenging, I would say probably are more challenging for us to assess in terms of an animal's health status, particularly as they age. So chronic pain, I think, is something which is incredibly difficult for us to A, assess and B, to manage. Um, so we see this even within our companion animals, our cats and dogs, uh, within our farmed animals, within animals that are highly domesticated and that we've lived with for thousands of years. So it seems sensible that chronic pain management is also going to be a challenge for us in our zoo animals when we're looking at species that are um, you know less familiar that are not domesticated um, etc etc now chronic pain can originate from many different pathologies it can be um, really challenging to determine and often the species that we're managing in zoos um, engage in masking behavior so they tend not to show overt signs of pain um, and they tend to mask that pain particularly as chronic pain is a degenerative process or is often related to degenerative processes and so it occurs gradually over time and so again this is where welfare assessments can be really useful for identifying those small changes in activity and behavior that may indicate that there is a chronically painful condition underneath of course in order to be able to monitor changes we need to have that baseline which is why doing your welfare assessments in younger physically healthy animals is really important because we can then identify and see those changes occurring over time and of course chronic pain is a significant welfare problem so pain in animals is an aversive sensory and emotional experience and it elicits protective motor action so certain behaviors that um, try and reduce that pain experience. So animals will avoid situations where they feel painful and they might modify their behavior. So they might be less social, they might engage in less foraging, they might um, reduce their activity, um, increase their sleeping, etc. And there are psychological responses to uh, the pain experience. We will often see um, increase in anxiety behaviour and that can result in, in social disruption. Um, there might be mental impairment, so we might see a loss of previously learned or trained behaviours. Animals might be more restless um, and we can see an increase in abnormal behaviours such as stereotypy or self-injurious behaviours. In our companion animals, um, pain is actually also strongly correlated with noise phobias and reactions to other things uh, which don't seem initially to be a direct pain response but quite often they're associated with sudden movement so if an animal startles at a sudden movement that can be painful so if an animal startles at a sudden sound that can be painful and very quickly the sound can then become associated with the pain and the animal can become frightened of the sound and we see that quite often across a range of species we get a disruption in sleep patterns, um, we might see antisocial behaviour and aggression, reduced activity which can uh, lead into this cycle of poor physical, um, um, poor physical health and reduced self-maintenance behaviours. 
So chronic pain management can be really challenging because firstly we need to identify that the animal is painful and that can be challenging in and of itself and then we need to be able to manage that pain appropriately and, and often that requires different types of pain relief because there are different types of pain that need to be targeted at different points in the nervous system. So it can be really complex and often just using one type of painkiller as a medicine might not be enough to manage that pain. Um, we can also use some husbandry techniques in order to modulate the pain experience because it is an emotional as well as a physical experience and there's pretty good research from the laboratory animal field that shows that enrichment and the promotion of positive mental states can modulate the pain experience and that's both in animals that are currently painful but also interestingly studies in rats have shown that if you uh, raise young rat pups in an enriched environment that actually protects against neuropathic pain, against nerve pain development later in life. So animals that are raised in a really good welfare environment, a nice enriched environment when they're young, are generally will uh, grow up with a more positive emotional state and that means they're going to be more resilient uh, to pain experiences when they are older. So good welfare is really important for the whole of life and the experiences that animals have when they're really young can have both positive and negative impacts on their welfare later in life. So that whole life uh, approach to welfare is really quite important. And of, uh, of course, if an animal is in constant or chronic or severe pain, then we do need to think about um, what its welfare state is and whether it has a life worth living. And there are, of course, situations where euthanasia may be a valid pain management strategy. Another thing that we uh, see in older animals, which can be uh, quite challenging to assess, but is worth considering in your animal welfare assessments, is cognitive decline or senile cognitive dysfunction. Now that's been uh, demonstrated in uh, great apes, domestic carnivores and dolphins, and it likely occurs across a range of different species. And across all of these species, we see changes that are very similar to the changes we see in the human brain um, in senile disease, such as Alzheimer's disease. Um, so they're, they're broadly similar pathologies in older animals as we might see in humans. We'll often see similar types of cognitive impairment as well. So we might see confusion, we might see restlessness, we might see uh, increased aggression or inappropriate behavioural interactions. So it's worthwhile just keeping these things in mind as animals age because often um, those sort of behavioural changes might not be recognised as being uh, part of this sort of underlying cognitive pathology. So again we see changes in social interactions, changes in the animal's sleeping and waking behaviour. We might see um, a lack of response to training or a loss of learned behaviours, changes in activity levels and increased anxiety. Those things are also things we might see with chronic pain and we might see them also with other different disease processes um, as well, so different medical conditions. So it's really important that when um, we're considering these different issues that we are trying to, to look at all of the different issues that might be occurring in the animal and trying to manage all of them and that can be really quite challenging. Um, we might see an increase in abnormal behaviours um, as animals age as well. Um, so this is uh, often because uh, anxiety levels can increase and animals may also demonstrate uh, less control, less impulse control. We often see um, reductions in, in various parts of the brain that are responsible for learning and memory as well. So all of these um, behaviours can be linked to chronic pain, to chronic to chronic stress or just to the, the aging process and the development of senile cognitive dysfunction. So as animals age it's important to be aware of these things and because um, these syndromes such as cognitive decline and chronic pain often occur in a, a very gradual and degenerative way our welfare assessments are really one of the best tools that we have for identifying these gradual changing, changes. However, addressing or 
these welfare challenges then once we've identified the problem we we then need to to do something about it really to ensure that animal does have good welfare and that can be really challenging it often requires um, quite a lot of planning in terms of animal husbandry and a significant investment of resources and time. We might need to consider the animal social grouping. We might need to consider its enclosure design, uh, especially if it has mobility issues. Um, the animal's um, engagement in operant conditioning programs. Uh, do we need to change the program so the animal doesn't get frustrated or doesn't get anxious about it if its learning is impaired? Um, do we need to provide different enrichment um, if the animal has limited mobility or um, isn't able to cognitively engage with that enrichment as well as it used to? Um, we need to monitor its activity budget. That would be part of our, our ongoing welfare assessment. We might want to also consider other systemic illnesses that could be um, happening concurrently. We consider pain management and how we might do that both in terms of medical and non-medical therapies um, and diet provision uh, and how diet might need to change depending on metabolic rate or or dental problems that that might need to be investigated so there are lots of things we can do to support good welfare in our geriatric animals but we also often need to consider the bigger picture as well um, and this is where the sort of ethics and the ethical decision making comes in and this is where our welfare assessments can be useful tools in helping us to make some of those decisions. Now there are differences often in how we uh, think about uh, using medicine in humans and how we might use medicine in animals and generally in humans there's considerable effort to prolong life even at a temporary welfare cost whereas as vets what we tend to do is focus on the immediate welfare impact and then the subsequent longer term welfare impact to the animal and also potentially to other members um, of the animal's group in social species so we and this is because um, humans have self-awareness, humans are aware of their own mortality, they're aware of their own impending uh, mortality and animals as far as we're aware do not have that awareness and so our focus has to be on their immediate welfare rather than on the, the prolonging of life. So there are different questions that we might want to ask ourselves relating to how we decide to manage um, animals that have a reduced uh, welfare um, quality within the zoo. So we need to ensure first of all that we are assessing the animal's welfare and that we're considering all of the different parameters so not just its physical disease but also behavioural, social and cognitive aspects. We need to, might need to think about how we're managing social species. Um, we need to think about how we would be uh, providing resources to manage any problems that are identified. So do we have the budget, do we have the resources, do we have the staff, the skills to, to effectively manage the animal's welfare. And then we get on to potentially other slightly more challenging ethical questions um, about allocation of resources because managing animals that have multiple health needs, that perhaps have welfare problems that need to be addressed does require investment of resources and we need to be comfortable with that, that that is a productive and effective use of our zoological resources and also to be able to assess whether those resources are then being diverted away from other species so if we are investing heavily in the medical management of one animal does that mean we then have less budget to provide enrichment to other animals for example how are these resources prioritized and budgeted for and this is again where our welfare assessments can help with making those decisions by ensuring that we're not focusing too much on one animal to the detriment of another so let's talk about making those end of life decisions and how we might use animal welfare assessment in that context so because animal welfare is concerned with the subjective experience of the animal, the experience of death is important to animal welfare. We want it to be humane, pain-free and stress-free. And in general, we don't consider a humane death to be a welfare issue 
in animal species that are not self-aware. So if they're not aware of their own lifespan and their impending death, then there isn't really a welfare issue there so long as the death is a humane one. Some people do consider that ending an animal's life early potentially deprives it of future positive experiences and that this may be problematic for welfare. But if that animal isn't aware of that, then is it really missing what it's not aware of? In general, within the field of animal welfare science, we focus on quality over quantity and the focus is on providing a good life and a humane death. But of course, your own personal response to um, ending an animal's life will vary um, depending on your ethical perspective. Now, ethics are the moral principles that govern a person's behaviour or the conducting of an activity. They're bas basically how we decide what's right or wrong. Um, and within different professions, there might be guiding principles. So within medicine or veterinary medicine, for example, we will generally take the principle of doing no harm. So within veterinary medicine, we focus on the animal's welfare and on minimising harm to the animal's welfare um, rather than on longevity or extending life to the detriment of quality of life, for example. Our personal ethics and our personal decisions about what we think is right or wrong are often influenced by our knowledge, culture, our education and our personal experiences. And this means because of this diversity and the different things that influence our welfare, it can be quite challenging for any organisations to formulate overall ethical principles or ethical guidance that cover multiple geographic regions. So animal welfare is really how the animal feels at that particular moment. It's that assessment of the animal's welfare at that particular time. And ethics is how we decide about whether our actions are right or wrong, how we decide what we should do and what we shouldn't do. So just as, a, as an example, if we consider euthanasia, um, then from an animal welfare point of view, the animal's experience during euthanasia is almost identical to that of anesthesia for a surgical procedure, for example. The animal uh, is medicated until it enters a state of unconsciousness. So the process of euthanasia is very similar to the process of anesthesia from the animal's point of view. Often those two things are, are basically the same. However, from an ethical point of view, there will be people probably in this audience who are comfortable with anesthesia as a routine process, but feel uncomfortable with euthanasia. And that is uh, because you have a diff different ethical perspective on what you feel is acceptable. You might feel anesthesia for surgery is acceptable, but, an but euthanasia is unacceptable. However, from the animal's experience, those two things are the same. It's the same experience to the point of unconsciousness. And once the animal's unconscious, it doesn't feel anything. So let's explore the term euthanasia a little bit further. Euthanasia literally means good death. It comes from the Greek um, and it focuses very much on the process, on the experience. We're not looking at the reason for this death. We are literally looking at what that experience is, and that experience being a good death. And was a defined euthanasia, so the World Association of Zoos and Aquaria define euthanasia in their welfare strategy as the humane, painless and distress-free termination of life using a method that produces concurrent loss of consciousness and central nervous system functioning. So what we're focusing on from a veterinary perspective or from a welfare perspective is that experience of death rather than the reasoning for the death. However, because we use the term euthanasia in other situations as well, that can become conflated. So in humans, um, in countries where uh, euthanasia of humans is legal, then euthanasia is intended to alleviate existing pain and suffering and the term mercy killing may be used. Also, humans are self-aware, so we need to think about things like consent around human euthanasia. Um, and this tends to focus much more within the human sphere on the moral reasoning for euthanasia rather than the experience itself, because in humans we can't separate those two things. Because humans are self-aware, we have to think about their autonomy and their input into decision making about their own life and death. 
with animals because they're not self-aware we don't tend to bring that reasoning into the process because the animals aren't participating in that decision making For, from a welfare point of view what's important to them is their experience so euthanasia um, from a, a veterinary or an animal point of view is very much about the process and the experience not about the reason for making that decision however our ability to make that decision around ending an animal's life is influenced by our ethics um, and we tend to be more comfortable with death that is more justifiable to us so for example killing to end suffering rather than killing a healthy animal for population management is generally uh, more comfortable um, interestingly killing an animal for human benefits uh, is more comfortable to some people than killing an animal for its own benefits to prevent or alleviate suffering and these are often cultural and they're often personal and we'll have different emotional responses to different animals in different situations um, from a welfare point of view the experiences are the same the animal doesn't care what the justification is the animal cares about its own experience that's what the animal's welfare is about so there's no real welfare difference to euthanasia for health reasons or to euthanasia for population management reasons except actually that the animal euthanized for health reasons is usually already sick and potentially suffering and therefore it could be argued that its welfare experience prior to death is, is actually worse, it's actually poorer, because we're waiting for suffering to occur before we take action. Um, however, we're often more ethically comfortable with that, with the euthanasia of a suffering animal, even though its welfare might be worse, than with a preemptive euthanasia of a healthy animal in order to prevent future suffering and to safeguard its welfare. So ethics aren't always cold and objective and logical there is that emotional component and that's what makes them tricky so let's come on to a famous example which i think most people are probably familiar with and i think this is interesting because uh you know hindsight gives us a bit of, of distance and and hopefully a bit more objectivity uh than the initial media frenzy that was was whipped up around marius the giraffe and his euthanasia in 2014 I remember there being a lot of discussion at the time as to whether this was euthanasia or not uh, and there were arguments made in the media and, and from various sources that it couldn't be euthanasia because it wasn't used to end suffering. Now euthanasia as we've said simply means a good death and within the zoo community it's generally recognized as the humane painless and de distress free termination of life. We're not making any judgments about the reason for that death. And he actually had a, a pretty good death. It was a humane euthanasia that happened during a trained handling procedure. So stress was absolutely minimised because the keepers had put a lot of work and a lot of effort into minimising um, that and making sure that handling was part of his routine husbandry. Um, and he was killed outright very quickly, uh, instantly unconscious. So there was no stress, there was no pain, there was no distress in that situation. So to my mind that absolutely meets the criteria of euthanasia the reason for his death is something absolutely separate that you can agree with or disagree with as is according to your personal ethics but from a welfare point of view i don't see a a, a strong argument that that wouldn't be euthanasia so welfare is about the subjective experience of that animal ethics is about what we think based on our own morals and viewpoints when we're thinking about the welfare of the animal we're focused on providing a good life and a humane death when we're thinking about ethics that's where our judgments our opinions our attitudes come into it um, and different zoological associations have produced different statements and supporting documents around making those end of life decisions because they are tough um, and there are different accepted reasons for ending the life of a zoo animal um, so this is just the uh, taken from the IASA calling statement. Um, these are the, the primary reasons that are given. So a serious and unavoidable threat to human safety, that um, the animals um, may be suffering in terms of, of you know, poor health or welfare, that the only alternative might be permanent transfer to accommodation, which cannot assure a proper level of welfare. So that sort of preventative approach to prevent suffering that the continued presence of the animal might be disruptive to a functioning social group 
or that maintaining that animal may put the population's demographic or genetic viability at risk. So these are broadly the reasons where we may consider euthanasia of an individual. However, it's not quite as objective as that. And whilst all of those reasons are, are pretty sound and, and evidence-based reasons for making that decision, there will also be other more personal and human influences on our decision-making around end-of-life decisions for, for zoo animals. So our personal beliefs, our emotional connection, our attitude and our culture will influence how comfortable we are with engaging in that decision-making process. The role that the animal holds in our collection, so often, and these are our generalisations, they won't apply to every person, but often we will be more comfortable with euthanising, for example, a domestic farm animal versus a, a more exotic zoo animal, such as a giraffe. Um, we will be less comfortable with euthanising a named animal, an animal that is uh, recognised by the public or that might be part of an adoption scheme for public engagement versus an anonymous uh, animal, you know, a deer within a herd, for example. How the animal looks um, will also influence our decision making and that sounds perhaps quite superficial but it's important to recognize that we are more empathetic to animals that are attractive to us and we find making these decisions towards attractive animals more difficult and again that was one of the things that impacted on um, the response to the marius situation um, our own levels of or engagement with anthropomorphism and our understanding of things like self-efficacy and self-awareness. It might be a decision that we wouldn't choose for ourselves, so we may therefore think that it's um, not appropriate to apply that to animals either. But animals don't have the level of self-awareness that we do. They're not able to make those choices. They rely on us to make choices to ensure their good welfare. And then um, the animal species or how closely related to us it is, its phylogenetics will also influence how easy or difficult it is for us to make that decision. It's going to be much harder for us to make that decision around a charisma charismatic mammal than around a, a lower vertebrate or an invertebrate, for example. And this has been shown through research. This is a fairly recent study that asked um, zoo staff in the USA about the acceptability of population management euthanasia by taxa. And we can see that the taxa that are most acceptable to be euthanized are rodents and the lower vertebrates and invertebrates. Whereas the more charismatic animals, uh, charismatic mammals are ones that have a low acceptability with uh, pachyderms, marine mammals and primates being completely unacceptable in terms of population management euthanasia. But there's no real objective argument to differentiate between those if they have a good life and a humane death why is the life of uh, an elephant more valuable or more highly prized by us as humans than the life of a rodent or a reptile there's no sort of real objective measure of that it is very much related to our own personal and emotional response to that situation but also it's related to our concerns around how the general public might perceive that decision making as well. And that's important, I think. Other things that might influence our end of life decision making are conservation resources and the role of the zoo in, in terms of its conservation activities. So can we manage these um, animals that need additional resources successfully in our collections? Um, will managing them have an impact on uh, breeding um, decisions made within the EEP? Are they occupying space that could be used by other animals that perhaps have a higher conservation value or are more um, active within EEP breeding programmes? Um, is it appropriate to use our limited conservation resources to maintain older animals that have significant resource requirements to safeguard their welfare? Um, are we inadvertently impacting other animals, potentially in other collections? Um, if we're maintaining non-breeding animals, does this mean that we're having to restrict breeding of other animals? And could that restriction of breeding be having a welfare impact on other animals? Or if we are maintaining and focusing our resources on non-breeding animals, um, could we inadvertently be 
um, increasing things like breed and cull activities, which again could be ethically challenging in some contexts in order to try and maintain reproductive and behavioural health. So when we're managing these populations across multiple sites and multiple collections, it is important to recognise that the decisions made in one location can have impacts on the resources and space and availability and decisions made in another collection. So there is a level of connectivity there when we're looking across populations and how ethics work in different locations and situations. So one of the reasons that we tend uh, not to make these um, these decisions very easily in terms of making end of life decisions is that it's really difficult. Um, making these kinds of decisions can be psychologically distressing uh, and as humans we tend to focus on how they make us feel and avoid any kind of conflict because avoiding means that we won't actively participate in making the wrong choice um, and this means that we can end up delaying euthanasia decision making and this can be detrimental to animal welfare and can cause conflict within the animal care team as well. So end of life decision making is really important um, regardless of what terminology you choose to use whether it's euthanasia whether you're talking about uh, euthanasia for population management reasons and you want to be specific about that whether you decide to use the term culling so long as you are clear about what you mean and that is clearly communicated then that is the most important thing because different people will have different ethical viewpoints on the acceptability or otherwise of each of those terms and those practices even though the welfare impact for the animal is often the same and it's really important that when we're making these difficult decisions that they're not delayed because of communication problems so we need to plan them in advance and make sure everyone is clear about what it is we're talking about so I'll just spend the last few minutes really talking about decision making for euthanasia uh, and how we approach that so as much as possible we want this to be a proactive process where we plan out the timelines everyone has a clear understanding of terminology and we have this uh, baseline data of animal welfare assessment that can help us to make these objective decisions by demonstrating um, that there are changes in this animal's welfare that we need to make decisions about. Do we invest in more resources? Um, is it possible to improve this animal's welfare even if we invest in more resources? Or do we need to start thinking about um, making an end of life decision? So there are a number of different resources out there around welfare assessment and end of life decision making so just to, to flag that they are available um, and different decision trees and different options for you to have a look at but generally what we want to do is develop and use a clear euthanasia policy which outlines the circumstances for euthanasia and um, determines who is mandated to perform it so it's about making that rational decision but it's also about determining who is involved in making that rational decision. Often we have to consider a variety of different factors and that might be um, around the species, its conservation status, its role in the collection plan, why we're making that decision, who's making that decision, how we communicate it, particularly to the wider public um, and our, our visitors uh, and ensuring that everyone is clear on what we're doing and why we're doing. So there are models out there for making rational decisions. They're often used in other sort of business uh, situations, uh, but this is an example of one of them. And essentially what we want to do is identify the problem that we are trying to address. So it might be something like a decline in the animal's welfare, might be an overpopulation problem, it might be a social conflict problem, etc., etc. Then we establish the criteria that we need to consider when we're making that decision. It might be things like the animal's conservation status, its welfare status, reputation and marketing concerns, the animal's role in the collection plan. Then we need to decide which of those criteria is most important and most critical um, in terms of the role of, of that particular zoo and what's important to the staff that work there. Have a look at different options and generate all of the different potential options that could be considered. So it might be an investment of resources, might be a transfer, might be changing the husbandry it might be euthanasia and then evaluate which of those options is most likely to result in a good outcome select that option and do it and that is your basic rational decision making process
The other thing we need to consider is who is going to make those decisions. And again, there are tools out there that relate to um, rational decision making and who should make them. This is a model called the RAPID model and it uses five different steps of recommending, agreeing, performing, inputting and deciding. And ideally we should be planning in advance who is responsible for each of those steps and recognising that who is responsible might vary depending on the different taxa, the different expertise in the staff and the role of that uh, species in the collection plan. We're not necessarily going to make a decision around a great ape euthanasia in the same way as we might make a decision around a rodent euthanasia, for example. But we do still need to have that planned out in advance. So that might look something like this. So the people that recommend euthanasia might be anyone from the keepers to the vet staff to the curator. But you then might need to get agreement from whichever of those other people are not um, involved in that initial recommendation. You might also want to get input from other aspects of the zoo, including people like marketing and education, to make sure that there are um, strategic communication, both internally and externally, around that decision. You need to make a final decision, uh, and who makes that final decision may uh, be one or, or two people, depending again on the legal and cultural situation that you're in. And usually who will perform that decision, for most cases of euthanasia, it would be the veterinarian. Um, but again, that might vary slightly depending on the legal uh, and cultural situation. So these are, are just a couple of models to, to consider because it's really important that we have that uh, rational planning and it's a proactive planning process. Moral stress um, in our employees and our team is reduced when objective measures and clear decision making pathways are proactively implemented and animal welfare is safeguarded if we have clear limits of acceptability. If we know um, through our welfare assessments what good welfare is for this species and we know when that starts to decline we can set clear limits as to when euthanasia needs to be implemented. It also can help us to allocate um, resources appropriately according to animal needs across a variety of different taxa and um, we can, it can help us with our collection planning to ensure that we are housing species which appropriately match the resources that the zoo has. So just to summarise, the term quality of life can be applied in lots of different contexts. So uh, usually evaluating the whole life experience or ending, uh, aiding with end of life decision making. And we need to be clear about if we're using the term quality of life, what context we're using it in. There are different ethical viewpoints on the criteria for decision making around ending the life of a zoo animal and these will vary depending on the species of animal that we are dealing with. So we need to plan in advance uh, and communicate around that to make sure that those decision making strategies are clear uh, and regardless of, of what taxa we're looking at regular welfare assessments can provide objective evidence to aid that decision making ensure appropriate resource allocation and collection planning so thank you very much for your attention um, so my contact details if anyone wants to reach out and i'd also uh, just like to give a plug for the next iaza animal welfare webinar which is animal welfare in relation to modern zoo practices and that will be on the 11th of december so you can register for that now thank you very much thank you very much heather Thank you very much for that. That was uh, brilliant, Heather. Thank you. And I hope you all very much enjoyed that. We have a few questions for you. Sure. Um, uh, so, shall I stop the screen sharing, Sally, or shall I just leave um, it up? Yes, can do. Yeah, can stop it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and just to add on to... Um, as Heather said about the registration for the next webinar, I've just popped the registration link in the chat and it's also on our Facebook EASA Animal Welfare page. So um, please do feel free to go there after the webinar. So um, we have a number of questions for you, Heather. So I will do my best to get to everybody. Thank you to everyone who did submit questions. Apologies if we don't get there today, but Heather has obviously kindly shared her email. Um, so you could potentially contact her afterwards if you um, would still like a answer. So the first person that I'm going to go to, and again, apologies for the really bad um, 
uh, names here that I'm going to get horribly wrong with pronunciations. Um, Wenike Shu, if I could ask you please to unmute yourself and ask Kevin your question. Yeah, I have a question. You stress in the beginning of the of the lecture that repeated welfare assessments are essential over the course of an animal life. Of course, I agree. But how often uh, would you need to do such a thing? And how would a zoo be able to do that with a very big collection? Yeah, that's a really good question. So. Um, there are obviously logistical challenges. So repeated welfare assessments, I think it depends very much on the, the taxa, on the, on the species. Um, if you have animals that are very short lived or where we don't have objective assessments that are well developed. So I'm thinking particularly around some of our lower vertebrates where welfare assessment is lagging very much behind more of our charismatic taxa. Um, you are probably going to be looking more at sort of life support mechanisms and provisions than what we might call a sort of a you know a good life or an enhanced welfare assessment. Um, for our longer lived animals you uh, could probably get away with assessing their welfare le slightly less frequently unless things are changing in terms of the provisions that you're providing for them. Um, it, it's just a real it depends question and I know that's not a very good answer but it, de it does depend so much on the keeper resource that you have available. I know um, a number of different collections are moving towards trying to develop rapid welfare assessments that are perhaps a bit what we call quick and dirty but highlight key welfare issues that can then once they're identified be explored in more depth with perhaps a more robust welfare assessment. Um, and I think we do need to be mindful of that because I think there's always this balance, I think, um, between sort of science and research science versus applicability and uh, practicality. And particularly in the zoo world where we have limited resources, limited staff, limited time and thousands of animals of hundreds of different species um, or thousands of different species in some collections, then the ability to be able to assess the welfare of every individual is is obviously going to be an enormous challenge so i think this is one of the areas where it'd be great to see um more communication and more a collaboration across zoos i think because i think if we see a lot of focus of welfare assessment particularly around the charismatic taxa whereas i think if we sort of divided and conquered and different zoos focused on different welfare assessments or different elements of welfare assessment for different species we could probably get better welfare assessment tools to use across a range of species um, rather than each zoo trying to do everything by itself um, i think that that would help because then by developing those welfare assessments we would get better guidance around husbandry and what um what husbandry we need to provide for good welfare and that would then filter into husbandry guidance from the tags and all of these things I think are connected. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you very much. And next I'd like to ask Emma Chen, if you could please unmute yourself and ask Heather your question. Hello, um, thank you so much Heather for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm very curious about one point that you've mentioned because um, you did mention that across different cultural perspectives people can understand animal welfare very I guess differently with different approaches um, I'm just curious um, about your opinion on how we how in animal welfare science we've come to understand that um, animals don't have more long-term planning and sort of we're more focusing on the immediate animal welfare state rather than like um, considering them maybe having a chance to like yeah, plan on their life um, ahead and how they don't have a perception of this. Just wondering if there's any like evidence for that. Thank you. Um, that's a really tricky question, Emma. So this is, and I am a bit hesitant about this, but it is one of those situations where it's probably where we're more relying on the absence of evidence. Um, there are some, uh, I guess, er experiments you can do with, again, it's different animals. A lot of these have been done in domestic animals, but uh, you can set up experiments where an animal, 
uh, waits for a greater reward or uh, takes an, a smaller immediate reward and for most animals they will go for the smaller immediate reward than take uh, than wait for, for a, um, a, a greater reward that comes later. Um, there are various experiments that have been done around that. Uh, they've actually done them in humans as well, in children, and there's actually an age limit in human children as to when when that sort of cognitive processing kicks in. That if I wait, I think it's about six or seven years old from memory, but um, if I wait, I'll get a better reward versus I'll just eat the, the candy that's in front of me right now. Um, so it's a fairly uh, high level cognitive process to be able to weigh and make those judgments and understand future, understand reward, etc. Um, and a lot of that science, I guess, to some extent hasn't been done across a lot of species. So I wouldn't want to definitively say that there isn't a capacity for that, but there's certainly no evidence of a capacity for that. In terms of emotional kind of processing and states, um, most of our mammalian species that we're familiar with have what we call prime or basic emotions. So these are things like um, joy, pleasure, fear, anxiety, which, and the, those emotions are associated with specific behaviours and survival. So if I feel frightened, I'll run away or I'll fight or I'll escape. Um, if I feel happy, I'll engage, it, engage in play behaviour or, or affiliative social behaviour, which helps to strengthen uh, my social bonds. So um, those basic emotions are associated with, with evolutionary successful behaviours. But some of the more complex emotions, things like guilt or jealousy, for example, there's very little evidence, if any evidence, that they exist in, for example, in our domestic species. So just to use a domestic dog example, one of the classic sort of experiments that was done was looking around uh, guilt of dogs that were told not to eat a treat and then the owner left, left the room and it f found that the dog's guilty behaviour um, was actually a it was actually triggered by the owner's behaviour on re-entering the room so if the owner re-entered the room and looked angry the dog would look guilty and actually those guilt signs are just anxiety signs so it's the dog's response to the human's behaviour. Um, if the human entered the room and didn't look angry, then regardless of whether the dog had eaten the treat or not, uh, it wouldn't look guilty. So we need to be quite careful about how we're interpreting animal behaviour and make sure that um, we're not misinterpreting it based on the animal's response to something else in its environment or to us. Um, grief is an interesting behaviour. There's limited um, evidence for it in our domestic companion animals but there's probably more evidence for it in some of our highly social zoo species so uh, animals like great apes obviously we know that um, female apes will carry around their their dead babies um, elephants engage in ritualistic behavior relating to grief but we so we know that they seem to miss the absence of that conspecific there is a, a, a loss sensation but we don't know exactly what that means in terms of their awareness of their own mortality um, or whether they, you know, how they experience that. It's just something that the science hasn't really, we, we just don't know. Um, so it does vary very much from species to species and taxa to taxa. And we don't have all the answers around that. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to go to Lauren. If Lauren, you could unmute yourself, please. Hi there. Um, yeah, fantastic talk. Um, something we've been dealing with quite a lot recently um, in, uh, in my job um, that I work in. And so over recent years, we've had uh, lots of um, instances of elderly pairs of social carnivores where one has been compromised due to health issues. Um, and so we've made the decision to euthanize on welfare grounds. Um, but at the same time, we've extrapolated the welfare of the um, remaining individual based on species behaviour and also what we know of that individual's behaviour. And so we've often had these um, instances where we've euthanized both at the same time. And I was just wondering how that potentially remaining individual, how that kind of extrapolation fits into a welfare assessment. And if there's been any research done on how we communicate these decisions to our visitors. Yeah, I think that's um, 
a really interesting question, Lauren. Um, and again, really difficult. These are really good questions. Um, yeah, so I think this sort of reflects maybe a little bit on the last question as well. And um, we definitely know that disruption of affiliative social bonds can be detrimental to, to welfare. So I think it is important to consider that if you have a, you know, well bonded animals, and particularly if you have a pair of well bonded animals, and one of them is, you know, on the the cards to be euthanized then the impacts of that loss on the remaining animal i think it is important to consider that that social loss um i mean from a, a slightly different sort of slant but from a population management point of view if we have an excess within that population what we want to try and do as much as possible is to remove euthanize animals when they're at their normal dispersal age uh, because that minimizes social disruption so it'd be an age when they they're sort of getting ready to leave the group anyway for some social animals we'll actually see older or infirm animals cast out of the group so you might see that with primates you you know you see bullying with primates where an older animal <clears throat> loses its status within the group and and that can be pretty miserable so actually then euthanizing that animal um if, if you decide that's the right option for you uh, doesn't necessarily have a detrimental impact on the remaining group but yeah in in the situation that you've described where you've got a closely bonded pair of animals that perhaps both have health issues and one needs to go sooner than the other are you better off euthanizing both of them at the same time i think the answer for that is is that no one really knows i've not seen clear evidence for or against and it's probably a bit of an it depends situation because it probably depends to some extent on the health and behavior of the the remaining animal um and how what that relationship is like how tightly bonded they are um how important that social interaction is um whether they would or would not socially cope uh once their their partner is lost and so there's going to be an individual element to that decision making i think um and unless we can gather information and, and that information can be shared which i think would be a really useful exercise to do looking at the impact of you know euthanasias on on a situation where you've got bonded animals and, and one is euthanized that's i think if you decide to keep the second animal alive then performing regular welfare assessments and and looking at the impact on that animal would be important but at the moment as far as i'm aware it's an area where we just don't have any data to make uh, you know recommendations about that thank you very much i'm moving to rashmi rashmi if i could ask you to unmute yourself please thank you for a wonderful lecture Hidda, ma hi rashmi uh, hello <laughs> Uh, my question uh, is regarding uh, euthanasia as a pain management strategy. Mm -hmm. So this being very comparative and uh, conflicting uh, between veterinarians as to when to decide uh, to take this strategy. Can you put some light on that? Sure. Um, I think, or like I said in the presentation, I think pain assessment is an area where we as vets could do better. Um, it is very difficult, it's very challenging. Again, it's a developing area still. Uh, we don't have objective pain assessments for a lot of our domestic species, never mind our exotic species. Um, but it is something that I think we could probably pay more attention to as a profession. Um, and then in terms of determining what's an acceptable level of pain, uh, I mean, for me, that's really problematic because um, we all experience some level, different levels of pain and discomfort through our lives. If it's a short term pain, you know, for example, uh, a limb injury or something that that will eventually heal and the animal will regain full function, then I think that's that's one situation where, you know, we can manage that pain in the short term. I think where pain management gets really problematic is, is is in the chronic degenerative pain because that's when it really becomes pathological it's not serving a useful purpose um it it is a uh, an, a significant welfare impact and if we look at studies done in in humans then chronic pain is something which is associated with uh you know negative psychological outcomes in in humans um and we see negative behavioral outcomes associated uh with with chronic pain in animals as well 
So I think if that pain cannot be managed so that the animal can enjoy a good quality of life, so that, you know, I think this is where our welfare assessments are important. If the animal is not able to engage in behaviours that it enjoys, if it's not able to engage in social relationships that it enjoys because it's too painful or it's constantly irritable or it just wants to sleep or rest all the time or it's frightened to move, then that animal's welfare is going to be poor. So this is where the objective welfare assessment looking not just at, at pain and specific pain behavior but looking at all of the different behaviors that an animal should be doing and whether it is able to to engage in those behaviors is is important sure thank you thank you very much and we just have time for a couple more questions so apologies now if we don't get to you um but could i ask beatrice to unmute yourself please Hi Heather, uh, this is Beatrice Montiero. Um, amazing presentation, thank you very much. It, it's, it actually follows a little bit the previous question from Rashmi, it's related to pain assessment. So um, my field of knowledge is, is especially in cats, domestic cats, and we do have uh, well-validated instruments for acute and chronic pain. And I was wondering if you know if vets have tried to adapt these or if, if these can be used in zoo cats uh, I guess just because their, their behavior is not that different thank you yeah so there are there are validated acute and chronic pain scales for domestic animals so in domestic animals um, we're moving for acute pain so for short term like surgical pain or injury pain we're moving quite often towards what we call a facial grimace scale where we look at the pain face so this occurs in humans as well if you're in acute severe pain you scrunch up your eyes you tense your brows your cheeks will bulge out and those muscle uh, shapes those those muscle tension is is common across most mammalian species so there are validated facial grimace scales developed for uh, rabbits rats uh, mice horses pigs cats and dogs uh, sorry not in dogs uh, and cats uh, and a few and sheep as well i think um and some of those could probably be applied across related taxa for acute pain um in dogs and cats there's also the glasgow short form composite pain scale which is a, a validated acute pain scale and then we have um for things like lameness assessment there are things like the cincinnati gait assessment score um and there are also a couple of other different gait assessment scores and then there are also some uh, owner ratings so owners assessments so quality of life assessments and similarly keeper ratings there are published studies in um in some of the zoological literature around keeper assessments of of um some of those things which which have been shown to be repeatable and valid as well so there are definitely resources out there i think it, it's probably just a case of to some extent accessing them or, or collating them um but a lot of them are are freely available um if you know where to look uh, somebody's just put the feline grimace scale uh, up in the in the chat i uh, just to say if there are any questions that i don't get to in this session if you want to type them into the chat i am happy to go through them later and send a response to sally if that helps that's very kind Heather. thank you do you have time for one more mm -hmm. yeah okay if we could go to please cat if you could please unmute yourself. Cat, do we have you? Cat toot. Oh, she might have had to go. So I will move on to Karen, please. Are you still with us, Karen? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Hello. still here. Um, I was just curious how uh, you might change the overall animal welfare template as applies to different species groups as in like mammals versus birds versus invertebrates would you change a structure or would you change each individual point sorry karen i'm not sure i understand your question what do you mean by the animal welfare template oh like the um like the quality of life you were describing earlier such as you know looking at the nutrition the environmental i see yeah so this is probably where there's a level of subjectivity, but also where we can rely, depends a bit on the species, uh, on the, 
the literature and knowledge base that we have. So I think this is one of the reasons that a lot of our welfare assessments are tailored more towards the mammalian taxa is because we ha the, the literature is biased towards mammalian taxa. So we have a, a much greater knowledge base around the behavioural and nutritional needs, environmental needs, for example, of, of those taxa and, and therefore our welfare assessments tend to, to be biased in that direction. Um, I think as a sort of broad framework, the sort of environmental, nutritional, behavioural, physical categories are, are useful regardless of the, the taxa, uh, but they would need to be uh, tailored, I think, depending on the species. So if you're looking at ectotherms, then your ambient parameters are going to be really key within your environmental resources. Um, whereas if you're looking at uh, uh, primates, you might be focusing more on sort of cognitive enrichment provisions, for example, or, or foraging opportunities. So I think you do need to have that knowledge of species ecology and understanding of how these species normally behave and the, the behavioural and environmental opportunities that they need in order to be able to sort of flesh out the criteria within each of each of those categories. Thank you. That does answer my question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heather. And I'm afraid we're going to have to um, close the webinar now. Apologies to all of you who we didn't get to your question. But as Heather said, um, we will be looking at the chat. I've made note of all your questions. Um, and um, please do also feel free to email me. You'll all have my email address from the confirmation email. And I can put you in touch with Heather there with you, from there with your question. But last but not least, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Heather for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you um, very much for arranging it. Right, my pleasure. Um, and thank you to everybody for joining us. We do hope you found it interesting um, and useful to your daily work. Thank you. It's such a hot topic at the moment and a really important one. So the more discussions we can have on it, the better. Um, a recording will be available. Sandrine has shared in the chat the link to that. That goes on RER's uh, YouTube channel. And that is also shared by our EASA Animal Welfare page um, on the website and our EASA Animal Welfare Facebook group. So please do join that group if you're not part of that already. And on our EASA website, the Animal Welfare page, you'll also find recordings of all of our previous webinars. Um, so please do feel free to take a look. Um, you can share those with your team um, and uh, there, all those resources are there for you. On the website, there's also an animal welfare library where institutions have very kindly shared their animal welfare templates and guidance that they use in their own institutions. And they've given us permission to share on the website with the wider community. So they are free, they are available for you to download, um, use the template as you will. You can adapt for your own institution's needs um, and those resources are also all there available for you to use. And if you do use an animal welfare assessment, quality or quality of life assessment within your institution and you would be happy to share with the wider community, please do get in touch with me um, and we would be very grateful um, for that resource. And the last thing, as I mentioned before and Heather mentioned at the end of her talk, um, if you would like to join us for our next webinar, we've shared the link in the chat and it's also already on our EASA Animal Welfare Facebook group. And that is with Thomas Bionda, who's going to be talking about the role of animal welfare assessments um, within the modern zoo practices and as a pillar underpinning the practices of modern zoos. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much to Sandrine behind the scenes fixing all the technical problems. And thank you very much, Heather, for being with us today. <laughs>